on the slide there, just, just to illustrate um, how we've become involved in strategic transport modelling. We need to hold decision makers' hands to make some decisions they don't want to make about how you allocate road space in order to facilitate modal shift. Uh, so we're working with the planners with existing strategic models and roughly speaking, the bottom left um, is the, the model that would be written, a visualization of the model that would be written by a transport planner. Um, upper left is an attempt to, to display an origin destination matrix. Now, we've done something there with uh, an idea based on a Delaunay tessellation, but each point is the center of a zone, and then we've rooted, we've rooted over all the lines that join those points, the demand in the OD matrix. And what's interesting is you kind of get red lines very roughly where the strategic roads are. Um, so there's an interesting circular question. Is the demand going that way? Is there a demand there because there's a road there? Or is there a road there because there's a demand there? And on the left, uh, there's, there's a, an image of, of a nowcast. And again, the whole idea is this, this could be used not just by transport professionals, but perhaps we could move away from producing 1,000-page reports that are the results of transport modelling and give this to the mayor, give this to the public um, who want to see what's the impact of that going to be on the traffic going past the front of my house. Um, and once you've got that kind of data, you can do stuff like accessibility analysis. And, and again, the data's there and can be used by different agents. If you, were, if you were building a development, you'd be interested in the accessibility for your development. You wouldn't necessarily want to look at the impacts elsewhere. Um, and there's no reason those, those tools are publicly funded. There's no reason they can't be made available. So what we have so far is a workflow management system, version control system, hosted on secure servers because uh, these transport models are deemed to have value and um, potential upset value when somebody realizes there is a person thinking of building an incineration depot at the end of my road or whatever else they're doing. Um, but this is where we're at at the moment. We, we have the ability to take a transport model, help manage the construction and validation of that transport model, and then share it with other professionals. And at this point, I want to step aside and just look a little bit at how transport modelling works. The illustration there, um, I'm going to be stating the obvious to many people, but it, it shows the four-step transport model um, that in theory is what happens when people build a strategic transport model. Um, I've never, I don't get the impression it happens that tidy, tidily, um, but that's, that's what's supposed to happen. And then you get some forecasts, and for the model to be valid, you, you make a forecast for the present day and make a very limited comparison with what you see in the real world from a few sensors. And if that's okay, you think, yeah, the model's great, so I now believe I can forecast what's going to happen in 40 years' time. Um, and, and really, all I was trying to highlight is that the current, the current way of doing transport modelling, and it's, it's a regulatory thing, it's something you have to do to a certain standard set out by the DFT, at every step, there's modelling going on, and yet there's only point estimates communicated from one step to the next step. So goodness knows what aggregation biases there were before we got the point estimate, but we're certainly losing all the variability. Um, so, I mean, who, who even knows whether it's worth making forecasts 40 years into the future, because the uncertainty could be, could be so wide, you might as well pretend there's no point bothering. We don't know. And um, so that... This is current practice. I haven't, I haven't put those bullets up there to read them out verbatim, nor expect you to read them. It's just if anybody wants to check later, I wasn't making it up. The first comes from a manual for some leading junction simulation software, and it tells you don't get hung up about calibrating this, this model in this software with cues you see in the real world. It doesn't really work like that. Now, if you're building a junction that has a right turn across a major road, and you think, oh, I'm going to put a filter lane in, you really do want to know how long the queues of traffic are that might build up to use that filter lane, but the software can't tell you that. Um, and then the second comes from DFT guidance on building strategic models. Everything that goes on when you build a strategic model is based on assumptions as to how people choose to route between origin and destination. 
but you're, you're not allowed to actually check that real people do what the model says they did. You've got to look and see whether the route's plausible. You know, could I drive from that origin to that destination by that route? Yes, I could. But nowadays, am I allowed to go out and get some uh, GPS data and some tracker vehicles and see how people are doing it? No. No, because that might um, give some very scary answers. Um, so, kind of where we're at, and, and the, the, the first point is the only point I wanted to emphasise, we're still at a world, we think, where we want to be able to take an estimate of demand for travel, place it on a network and predict what's going to happen. In order to do strategic transport modelling, in order to say, if Heathrow gets a third runway, and there are that many more people coming to Heathrow, what's the impact going to be on the transport network and how's it going to cope? It's, it's out of, it's kind of, you know, it's an extrapolation. It's beyond any data that can guide us to what's going to happen. We have to use a transport model to do that. Um, but what we don't do um, at all is incorporate uncertainty. And I don't know, for, for nearly 20 years now, people have been talking about journey time reliability as being an important decision maker, an important economic factor. Not in transport models, it isn't. You just model an average day, and you ignore Fridays because they're a bit weird, so an average Monday to Thursday. That's, that's what gets modelled. Um, and what doesn't happen smoothly yet is the ability to model, um, to, to model it's the transport model is a very specific layer in, in all the things that could change. So you don't, you, it doesn't itself deal with, well, what would happen if I built a new hospital or a new housing estate? Brilliant for saying if I built a new bridge here, if I want to do a predict and provide approach to transport um, and put a bypass in, maybe it's fine, maybe. Um, but it, it just doesn't integrate across all the different layers of modelling. Um, and again, that's something, something we're starting to put together. But most importantly, it doesn't yet. Very few, some systems have the capability, but there, there doesn't seem to be the will in, in the decision makers to do things like multimodal transport. So, so on all the city models we've seen so far, buses are just a nuisance. They're modelled because they impede the free progress of cars. What matters is getting cars around. So the wildly revolutionary and disruptive thing we're doing is not measuring flow by the number of vehicles moved, but measuring flow by the number of people moved. All of a sudden, bus lanes become attractive things to have because you can move more people more quickly. Utter cost for the cars. Um, but if you don't measure it, I can't remember the Einstein quote, it's gone from my head, but if you don't measure it, you don't know it. If you measure cars going down a road, you think that's all that matters. It isn't until you have the metric people start thinking about that. And the other bit of circularity I alluded to in one of our screenshots, um, traditional transport models still aren't great at, at, at looking at the way demand gets changed. They're not great at looking at induced demand. You can prove your bypass will speed people's journeys up by 20 minutes. You can't then reallocate a whole load of man demand because more commuters will lose that corridor. So um, variability is one of the things where we can get estimates of variability. Um, here's, here's some data derived from um, one of the standard transport catapult type GPS data sets. So it's, it's, it's an estimate of the speed on specific links. Um, and what we've done is very arbitrarily picked a, a route somewhere in Exeter, and you can see during the week there's a lot more variability. The one on one, the left left hand most one is weekday. Um, top and bottom are rush hours. There's more variability on a weekday than at a weekend. Um, the more complicated, the more confusing plot on the right. It's an attempt to see where along a route. So the x -ax, the x axis is is just distance along the journey. And it's, it's a look to see where the variability comes from, which bits of the network are, are kind of causing the delay. Which, um, so it's, it's, it's an attempt, and we've got all sorts of horrible 3D and mappy versions of attempting to visualise that. It's quite a complex idea. Um, so once you've got the GPS data, the kind of thing you can do on the left, same as I saw with a screenshot earlier, this is just access times to some point in Exeter based on GPS data. Don't use a transport model, use the GPS data, we've got it. That's what it looks like at 8 in the morning. Um, but then th the one on the right, um, a little bit more uh, exploratory. What we're doing is we're using the, the, the GPS data 
to, to pick a route between two points. So pick a load of strategic routes and then imagine that one link on that route got blocked and then see what happens. So we're not yet looking at reallocating all the traffic. That's what the first car to know about that delay would be tempted to do. So you can imagine that, that there is a much di more direct route between those two points. But if you take out one link, I can't tell you where along the road it is. If you take out one link and know about it, you'd route round there because that's your next best choice getting from A to B. So we're starting to, it's a way of starting to look at which bits of the highway are sensitive um, and, and starting to measure how often that happens. And again, the, f the fun and games is how, how do you turn that into a metric people understand? But the whole idea is to try and say, you, you really don't want um, incidents on, on that bit of road. It's a nuisance. You need to spend to make sure it doesn't happen. If you're lane charging utilities, there's some places here you want to charge them more for than others. Um, plot on the left, um, something that can only come from induction loops, but it's, it's, you, you, you all recognize the kind of bottom part of that plot. It's a kind of lovely little speed flow curve. But as has been alluded to before, it's really difficult getting hold of that data. Um, we had to download that data by picking a spreadsheet for every day um, individually and kind of downloading and merging. Um, it's not yet something we can routinely put in somebody else's hands to evaluate the models with. Um, the, one, the other one's just um, a, a thing we did showing kind of GPS derived speed showing where congestion happens. But just to illustrate, I'm going to kind of pick out uh, a signalized junction in Bridgewater for no very good reason. On the left, um, we have some predicted model flows. And, and basically, I've, I've picked out one arm. And it says, in an hour, 338.2 vehicles will go down that arm. And, and the whole point is, when you look at the scatter plots of some data we pulled out of Scoot, um, what normally happens is that 200 vehicles go down that arm. So, here we have a kind of DFT approved, wonderful, super fitting model, but yet the real world isn't working like that. Um, maybe it did when the model was built a few years ago. It's definitely not fitting that description now. But more importantly, what's screamingly obvious from the scatter plots um, is the amount of variability, which is absolutely not accounted for. And again, the whole idea is try and put this kind of information so that people will talk to each other. Um, here I pick another arm. This is just a rant about queue length predictions. If you look at the screenshot I grabbed from um, Google, Google, Google Street Maps, you'll notice there's a lot of cars queuing. The model suggests there'll be between one and three cars queuing. So I don't know what distribution queues follow, but I do know that's way off in the tail the day uh, Google took that photo. And you question how plausible that is. Um, likewise, pick another junction. The, the histogram on the right the blue line is showing you the modeled prediction of how long it takes to get around that junction. And when we've got some GPS tracker vehicles, the pink histogram tells you how long people actually take to get around that junction. And you just, you, again, you just can't square the two. And again, it could be that the model was right when it was built, but for some reason, that's not how it's functioning now. Um, and, and yet people make kind of big decisions on, on these models. Um, so. One of the things I was going to say about the kind of machine learning from the GPS speeds, there's, there's value in, in, just, in just a nowcast model that, that predicts the plumbing accurately because, because that helps you, you check every part of your network. Um, and, and we need better predictive models. The idea of strategic transport models is that we can predict what's going to happen um, in the future. But one of the things we're not doing is not using hindsight. We now have these very cheap data feeds coming in all the time, they're not linked because it's a different silo to the transport models. So you, you write a transport model 10 years ago, it looks dreadful. Your forecasts for now are dreadfully wrong. It's not about beating somebody up for it. It's about looking at why are they wrong? What's changed? Uber's changed. That's what's changed. Fine, understand it all. What do we have to do next time? But the most important thing, trying to emphasize there, We've got to communicate and handhold decision makers through using this kind of information. It's a very risk averse culture. Um, I, the, you've all heard the phrase NIMBY. I don't know if you've heard banana build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. Um, but, um, you know, to make the decisions that need to be made, decision makers need a lot and lot and lot of support. 
And in that short presentation, I've just given a hint that some of the metrics, even describing congestion, journey time, reliability, is going to be quite challenging. Um, so we think this kind of shared tool where, where everybody's getting maybe restricted views but of the same thing is, is the place to start helping them make the decisions we need to decongest our cities. Thank you. Thank you.